Oh, I have to press Hello, stop. Okay. Viewers, welcome yeah. to our new Spotify podcast. With we call it the Bros with the li Literature Arts. Today we are with Ian and Diego, and we will be reviewing the book Fahrenheit 451. Lads, say hello. Um, hello. All right. So, who would like to start off the discussion first? I would just like to say, uh, 1948. No, 1984 is definitely better than this book. But other than that, the book was okay. Thoughts? Uh, uh, I agree with you, actually. I like 1984 more. Yeah, I mean, this one just more, like, I feel like there's more, like, stuff going on, like, like physically going on in uh, 1984, like, with, like, the government and stuff. This is more just, like, uh, Montag's, like, mind, like, I guess, like, and how he thinks and views the world and how, like, a, like, I don't know, just, like, yeah, I also thought it was inter yeah, I thought it was interesting too how you get the perspective of Winston who like works for the government and he's like controlled and Montag well I guess he works for the government too, but he's like kind of like the person that that is the government. Like he burns down the houses. So you get like a perspective from both points of views. So I thought that was interesting. I just saw nineteen eighty four as a as a much more complex book compared to this book, because I feel like this book was a lot more straightforward on what the meaning was and the message it tried to deliver, and then 1984, it tried to mess with your mind and everything like that. All right, enough about 1984. Yeah. Let's start the discussion about <clears throat> Fahrenheit 451. Who would like to begin? I'll start, uh, I guess. All right. Whatever. So, basically, uh, it starts with the this guy named Guy Montag, and it's kind of a dystopian society with a totalitarian policy. I don't think we need the summary. Just but, talk about, like, some, like, thing you're interested about. Well, be, well that's just, like, the basic setting of what, uh, oh, okay. ha like, where this place starts off, and, uh... Uh, Montag is like a firefighter, so he ha his job is to put out the fires, and um, like books are basically the thing that are not allowed in the society. So it's a uh, pretty interesting to see how Montag is basically controlled; his mind is controlled, and uh, they're not allowed to gain free thought. Everything is um, like Ian, you supposed know from the, the government, fires, right? Yeah, he starts the fires, but like from there, his opinions like don't matter like he's controlled by uh the government or like their policies like he can't have his own kind of thoughts he can't read you know like he's his job is to um put out the fires and do what he's told from the fire department so yeah so i really liked how the author decided to use the the phrase firefighters to describe them because normally to us we picture firefighters putting out fires not starting the fires so i thought it was really mm -hmm. interesting that he chose firefighters instead of anything else i feel like that makes the story a lot more complex and it makes you it makes you really think because at first you're like oh they're firefighters they're gonna put out a fire but instead in this oh, yeah. society it, sh it shows how corrupt everyone how corrupt society is because firefighters are starting fires and they're burning books which are super important to society yeah uh one thing i wanted to like say like about like i guess like the author also like how he like kind of like predicts like kind of ish like the future like like you see how like the seashells that like mildred was like uh talking about or like had on are basically like modern day airpods and this was written in like 1953 and like wireless communication with like uh favor and like his like green bullet thingies i think that's just pretty cool yeah so are you so, saying it was like futuristic like well he like like he this was written it? in the 1950s so like yeah like okay. how, how was he gonna know I guess. yeah so i see of parallels of like the the themes from this story relating to the future just like how in 1984 you could still see how mm -hmm. things like that are still happening in the world whereas in this book uh books are essentially banned now and the more you look into how life is now, a lot of books are getting banned. Like, books in schools are starting to get banned. It shows how we are starting to, like, de-evolve as a society. How we would... How now we're just banning books and banning knowledge, essentially. Just like how this book sort of predicted it. Wait, what do you guys think on, like, books? Do you think all books should be allowed, no matter how, like, graphic and uh, sensitive they might be to others? Or do you think that, like... There should be like a policy on what books people can or can't read. 
I mean, at I least for a high school level, at least, let's say. I mean, I don't know. I think it's kind of almost denying free speech if you like just like censor books, because then you kind of get like, like let's say, like in this book, there was a part where they said like, uh, if like white people don't like a certain book, uh, then the government will take it away because then people will be happier that way, and like that's basically like if someone doesn't like a book, it doesn't mean they should like try to ban it or something in like schools or whatever because even though it may have like sensitive topics it may have like to- uh, like um um uh, morals or like something like that to like actually that has like actual meaning and the people aren't like picking up on and like i think it's just like uh not a smart idea to like ban books just cuz like there's like some weird words in it or something yeah, I feel like if we start banning books, it's basically just the idea of this story, basically, on yeah. the reason why they're banning books is so everyone is happy. And if we do that, then we're starting to become more like this book, and then we'll become more simple-minded. We won't really think for ourselves anymore, like just the characters in the book, how his wife Mildred is basically an NPC. She doesn't think, she doesn't think for herself the government basically tells her how to think and she will think that way because that's all she knows she thinks any book that says anything will just hurt someone and that is just terrible for the world yeah i think i agree with you guys but i also wanted to just add like it's interesting how they don't really give a specific place or time of when this book is so it kind of just shows you how the country can be affected by like media and censorship how like a country can just uh yeah basically censor um, free speech and free thought. So, I mean, it's books. A general I think it. Basis on I think it actually it said like in like like twenty twenty two century or something like that. It, it gives you. I think a general, actually said like time range of it, the book. Yeah, but it's not like specific. You know what I mean? But I don't yeah, know, I just that was interesting. I thought it. I'm pretty sure it's like twenty first century ish. Yeah. But um, another thing I want to say is that like literally everyone like portrayed in this book is basically like NPC. They basically are just like super simple minded. And like, don't like just conform to like the government what they want to say. And like, there was this uh, conversation between uh, Mildred's friend, I can't remember her name, like Mildred's like friends and uh, Montag, and they were basically like talking about like politics. And like that's like when he like wrote uh, read the 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 poetry to like them, and then like they got like bad. But they were talking about, like, politics, and, like, they were talking about, like, oh, yeah, I voted for so-and-so because he was taller and he, like, uh, like, looked better and wasn't, like, fat or something. And just how, like, people, like, don't even care who, like, is, like, president or something anymore. They just, like, want them to look good, and that's kind of, like, the whole, like, thing. Like, people don't care about, like, people's political agendas or whatever. People don't care about, like, the meaning behind anything they just care about how if it looks good and makes them feel good in some way yeah and that's like a section of the book in particular i loved how the author like specifically like wrote it to where the characters because she was asked what her favorite tv show was and she was like oh you know that show and then the husband is like what show and then she's like that show i love how the author like emphasizes the idea that they are so like dumb that they don't even know what show they're watching what they like they just say it's that show they just watch it because it's on tv basically Mm -hmm. yeah i mean like mildred's an interesting individual because like throughout the story you you get to realize that her and uh montag's relationship is really separated like i think even in the story like a couple times they said that they slept in separate beds or yeah separate beds and it kind of just shows you i always kind of like tie this book into 1984 because like when i when i read it it kind of just like pops back into my brain and it like it's a lot to relate with like i don't even like they, they don't even show intimacy either and all her thoughts have just been like like you guys said what like society has just caused her to not be able to really think about her like like think beyond she hasn't really been able to get that to that free thought free speech kind of thing she's kind of just been um singled out but yeah yeah and um i think another thing is that like literally everyone even though that they are supposedly getting all the entertainment and excitement that they want uh none of them are actually happy like uh mildred like taking like 40 sleeping pills in like the beginning of the book and uh also like when 
uh, Montag was talking, like, saying the poetry and then got mad at Mildred's friend. Uh, he was saying how, like, his kids, her kids, like, don't uh, love her and how, like, he's on, she's on, like, her fourth husband or something. Obviously showing that, like, they're not happy and I'm sure this relates to, like, everyone in, like, the society. So it's just really, like, ironic how the world has, like, conformed to making or trying to make everyone as happy as possible but at the same time failing to do so because they like just can't think for themselves and they're just like shells of people they're just like empty husks uh an interesting thing about the book is that it's how it's structured because at the beginning the um, guy is essentially he believes everything he's doing is correct he thinks the girl is somewhat delusional on what she's thinking and then throughout the book in the middle of the book he starts questioning himself he's like should i really be doing this should i not be and then you see the full development of him as a character where at the end he and the group of of thinkers uh after the city is destroyed and bombed they are going out into the world trying to teach people and find s survivors again so i found it was really interesting how at the beginning he was just basically like everyone else and then in the middle she, he kind of became the girl clarice i believe her name was and then at the end he became essentially one of the thinkers basically so it was really interesting to read that the character does develop into an actual human at the end well in my opinion i think clarice pretty much drives this story from the beginning um her getting I think if it wasn't for Clarice, Montag would have never changed his development as a character. I think he would have just continued in that same path. You get a perspective from a 17-year-old who doesn't really have a job or anything. She's kind of living life. She was more of like an adventurous wildlife type of person, right? So when she started asking Montag all these questions about if he was happy or not, it kind of made Montag think, kind of like the discussions that we have in literature class when Rudd like puts a thing on the board it kind of like sets you back because you're everyone's moving at like a quick pace you don't really have time to think about things so I think that when that question was presented in Montag he had to take back a second and really think and be like is this what I really want and he starts reflecting on things like Mildred on his job like is he really happy is this really what he wants for himself and it kind of just leads the story further down yeah I think that definitely meeting like Clarissa was like the main like thing that like started off or Clarice sorry uh started off like his adventure into like trying to like think and like learn new things more and not just being like everyone else because she actually made him like like you said like reflect um and like think about the world and that's like the big like biggest like thing in the plot the like that's like the catalyst I guess in the plot that started everything else yeah, so uh, I want to take a look at the setting, actually. What do you guys think about the setting and how it like relates to the book and everything like that? <clears throat> well, uh, yeah, uh, you can go, Diego. Sorry. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know. I was just going to say how, I mean, it just seems like this like, modern, like very futuristic world and how, I mean, it's basically, I'm pretty sure it's just like showing how the world like could be in the future since it was written like way earlier you're just trying to like kind of warn like the future like uh generations about how like you know um how we should like take an approach on uh literature and like classic like novels and, and like media and stuff and tr not try not to like censor everything <clears throat> uh yeah i think it's more of like a dystopian novel set um you kind of get like obviously like you start realizing that you get like weird ideas from like hearing that firefighters like actually put the fires instead of taking them out and uh it's kind of like ties into like the tone with like intense and gloomy um like it's kind of got like an apocalyptic like atmosphere like things hanging over the city and like threats of nuclear war and then like the totalitarian policies that like is in montag society so it's kind of interesting, um, but yeah. So I imagine the um, the setting to be more like relaxed. Like I don't know if you guys remember Levy Town from U.S. history, but I just or my neighborhood. I could so when I was reading the book, I pictured it more like my neighborhood. How everyone just 
does what they're supposed to. They don't really think about their doing what they're doing. They just go on with their daily life, basically back and forth, back and forth. They're doing the same thing every single day without question. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's how I picture the setting to work. But I yeah, think, I've, I've, yeah. Go on, sorry. But I think that works really well with the book because I feel like if it if the setting was like something in like downtown New York where everything is crazy i don't think society would be able to function like how it does now because this way the government can monitor everything because it says how uh towards the end like the government <clears throat> like writes down everything about you for like years on end and that's why um guy eventually when he was quote unquote caught they were able to know that someone was going to be there so they could frame that guy instead of guy himself so i feel like if it was any other like, if it was, like, New York and not as structured as, like, how Naples is, it wouldn't be able to function because the government can't really keep eyes on everything if it was in, like, New York or something like that. But since it's, like, somewhat like Naples, I picture the setting, the, uh, the government can do as they please and keep the citizens dumbed down and blissfully ignorant. Yeah, I agree with you, like, how it definitely should be, uh, like, kind of more like a relaxed town um but also there's like just like war going on and like people are kind of just like oblivious to it which is weird um they just like well i mean i'm sure like they know what's going on but it's just i just find it really weird that uh they're none of them are too concerned they're all literally just there like having a fun time even though there's definitely things wrong in the world and no one seems to like care literally at all yeah, so when they got to the war part in the book, all I could picture was just 1984. Because in uh, Fahrenheit 451, it said how the on the like new system, I believe it was the old man that Guy was talking to, he said how they were lying. Just like in how in 1984 they lied about how the war was going, how in Fahrenheit 451, instead of only sending 1 million people, in reality it's more like 10 million people. And how in Fahrenheit 451, they don't really say how the war is going. They just said, oh yeah, the war should be over in about tomorrow or something. Because I believe that's what um, one of uh, Clarice's friends said, that their husband is going to be, oh yeah, my husband, my husband's going to be back in a day or so from the war. I think it also ties into, like, government controlling, right? Because um, it's just kind of interesting how they're kind of stuck in that setting. And it almost seems like since there's a war going on, they can't leave as easily. Like like you were kind of alluding to it in uh, the book 1984. Like, Winston couldn't really leave during that time because all the... I mean, also, he would get, like, arrested and stuff. Uh, I don't know necessarily if that would happen here, but it just seemed like the society was just more toned towards, like, believing it and just continuing to do what they normally do and trying to avoid as many problems as they can so just following the news yeah they they're kind of just all like just like bots running around like obviously nothing going on um but i think there's this line that i i think i put down yeah uh that just like goes to show like how like much like uh guy changes in such little time it says, only a week ago, pumping a kerosene hose. I thought, God, what fun. Which was just, just like, shows how in, like, just one week, total chaos has, like, occurred. And it's, like, crazy to think that this whole book, it just went on in, like, a couple of days. And how, from, like, the time he met Clarice, there's, like, a couple of days later, then he was, like, thinking. And then, eventually, he brought the books home. And then, like, he got chased down. And then the world just, or his city just exploded. It just happens really quickly. So, I don't know if you guys noticed there a lot, but the book, like, mentioned a lot of religious books. Do you guys have any, like, ideas about what the religious books have to deal with this book? Because, like, towards the end of the book, <clears throat> Guy is known as the book of Ex Exlatius or something, and I looked up the book, and the the meaning of the book is basically life is meaningless, mm. and I feel like that is that parallels so well with guy himself because towards the end he was kind of like well why do we really live if all we do is nothing if we don't contribute anything to society and how the free thinkers at the end had to talk him into well did you touch anything did you do anything and he was like well yes i did touch something so they said how he did contribute to society do you guys have any 
opinions on the a lot of because I know they mentioned a lot of religious books throughout the story. Well, the first one that I think Montag got was the Bible, and he begins to like memorize specific parts of it. And like one of the specific parts was him being that guy named Echolictes or something like that. And uh, it's basically like the pain and frustration uh, engendered by observing and meditating and meditating the distortions and inequalities uh, pervading the world. So kind of like the the path that he was going through um trying to get through his life um with the with like with him having books in his possession when he's knowing he's not supposed to and then ha knowing the consequences if he gets caught um uh like his house being burnt down so yeah yeah i mean i think there was a lot of like uh religious like imagery and like stuff like that and like obviously the books that he was reading um like one time he was like referred to um like the people in the town as like just like uh like class figures in a church just because they're like so like still and like don't really do anything like of meaning and um uh, there's a lot of that like scattered like throughout the book yeah so like one thing that i kind of liked about the character was that like you did see him change towards the end of the book but like in the middle you could still see how he still believed that burning was fun because that just shows how like because if you guys think about it if i live like 20 years of my life believing that books suck we should burn them all down to the ground and then are, you're telling me that in just about two to three days my entire view changed i love how like he still he still holds a little bit of his past when he's changing how he thinks he just does it completely abandon everything from his past well also with the smell right like i remember him talking about like like when clarice said what's that smell on you and like he had just gotten off work and he's like oh i'm used to it it's like something i like so i mean it's already kind of into his brain like he's used to it it's something that that's a, that was a part of him um at the beginning so yeah i think um yeah, he, like, kind of, like, there's still parts of him, like, towards, even towards the end of the book that, like, still kind of, like, uh, like, old traditional, well, not, not traditional, like, well, just more, like, old values that are, like, about this kind of society. What I mean, it's, like, when he was getting, like, chased in the, the chasing scene, obviously, he was, like, he was, like, wow, there's, like, 20 million people watching me, like, I feel, like, like, such a celebrity, like, so, he said, like, something like that, and, uh, that just shows how he still has that, some part of, like, the culture that he was, like, raised and grew up in, like, there, and that hasn't completely conformed to, uh, how, like, he should be with, like, reading and, like, thinking about everything, he just thought of, like, like, kind of, like, the glory in the moment i guess yeah so one piece of symbolism that i thought of throughout this book was the the old lady that uh died with her books i felt like that lady kind of symbolizes like something like jesus and god how like he sacrificed himself so everyone can think has a new way of thinking <clears throat> she was basically the jesus jesus slash god for guy because he at that moment he changed how he really how he viewed the how he viewed society now he he decided to take home books he decided to read them he decided to figure out why people would be willing to sacrifice themselves for something like this and then he figured out why he learned so much from them he understood that this society he lives in right now he is not truly happy he is upset he wants to understand why he's upset though yeah, uh, one piece of symbolism I actually got was through the fire, and it's kind of cool how uh, Bradbury, the author, used this. Um, he kind of referred the fire into like the actual title of the book, like four hundred and fifty-one degrees, at which like they would burn the houses, and uh, that's like what uh it takes for paper to burn. So I thought that was interesting, and in how he's able to like use that into destruction and rebirth as well as knowledge because it kind of just goes through the development of Guy Montag as a character, understanding like he kind of like at the beginning like he burns things, then he starts to reform, and he kind of like creates a rebirth in himself as like him meeting with Clarice and then realizing everything 
uh, realizing Mildred as well as the individual like that he's with, um, like change like how they're the, the exact same and he's starting to take a look at everything um from like a different perspective now because he's understanding that this is like a person that he wants to change and he's starting to realize that uh maybe this wasn't the real the very person that i thought i was and then the knowledge that he gains throughout that as well i thought that was pretty interesting yeah um i think how like the way that um montag views like fire like kind of changes throughout the book too like in the beginning he was he only thought of like fire as like being destructive and like to like burn things but like as you go on through the book like especially at the end end like when he's like uh with like granger and like on like the other like uh like the countryside he begins to realize that like they're like sitting around a fire so fire can also like bring like warmth and like like uh rejuvenate life as well uh and like he comes to like realize that and he comes to see how it can be like beautiful like that and um yeah i just thought that was interesting i think the most ironic character in the story would have to be the captain because <clears throat> uh as you read he was like the most knowledgeable one he out of everyone there basically read the most books but he was the one who wanted who told a guy to just burn the books immediately don't even think about them it's just a dumb thought every firefighter has once a month or something just burn the book away but in the end you could see how the books and all the knowledge he's gained from the books made him realize how how miserable his life is when he died because he like he kind of just sat there and was hoping to die really he he was telling guy you won't pull the trigger you're use he he spews all these uh, literature ideas on him but you could s see how he was he was unhappy with his life because when he died he died a very nice and peaceful death he he accepted his death he wanted to die basically um, I'll go next uh do you want to go i'll go if you want oh i'll go that's fine uh what i was gonna say about that is that yeah Beatty is like i think he can be like considered to be like the opposite of like faber because like while they're both like intellectuals and they know like a lot about books like one of them obviously believes that like bd like thinks that like books like are stupid and then sh like should be like get rid of because they don't make people happy and they're just like nonsense but even though he's read a bunch of them um but like faber the old guy just um like believes that like society should be like built around the ideas and knowledge that you can gain from books and uh i just thought it was interesting in how they like are definitely like opposites and are supposed to be like portrayed that way and how like it affects like which side do you kind of want to be on like baby side or like favor side like if you're montag like which one do you choose yeah i think uh baby's more of like a complex person because he's kind of contradicting himself sometimes when he like speaks to montag because i mean montag gets the idea that books are horrible or like bd tells gives them the idea that that books are horrible and all that yet montag like you guys said comes to realize that bd's actually read the most out of any firefighter and he's like the most educated from like literature and stances like that so when um he uses that to manipulate montag it's uh it kind of makes it interesting because like bd like sort of wants to continue to like bd's like idea is that he doesn't want people to get out of to get into free thought he wants everything to be the way it is and he prefers like there not to be quick stress and like like always like for there to be pleasure in his life and no like worries or anything like everything to be set straight and if people start to read they start to understand other things and start to question more so i think he just wanted more of a straightforward um like concept of life i guess speaking of life did you guys know that this podcast is sponsored by the super mario bros movie please go watch it it is currently oh in God. theaters right now Mario faces off against Bowser in order to protect Princess Peach. Thanks for watching. Oh, wait, hold on. We're not done yet. But, um, yeah, I just had to make sure we go with the sponsor because 
they, they kind of paid us a lot of money. But other than that, is there oh, yeah. anything else you want to talk about? Well, what? <laughs> no. Ian, Ian, this podcast is sponsored by Super Smash Bros. I have to make sure I introduce the sponsor. Where's my cut? You don't get one. This is this is I get paid. I'm the host of this <laughs> the, the, the thing. Sky man. All, All right. right anything bro. else we want to mention? Any last things? Anything last that we remember? Anything important we want to say? Well, it'll be the uh, last high school book I read. <laughs> uh, what do you guys rate the book out of ten? Hmm. I give it a seven. I give it a five. I wasn't too hyped on it. Oh, one thing that I did find interesting about the book seven. is how like it shows how like our kind of society is going more into like we have really short attention spans because like in the book it says a- about how they had oh, yeah. to make things shorter and shorter and shorter like how in Macbeth it used to be a novel and then it used to be like half a novel and then like a quarter of a novel and then because of how everyone is losing attention span it's like five sentences long we could really see that nowadays with TikTok and how like if you want to watch a video some people need like eight different things in the video to be able to keep their attention there so I found that really interesting and a nice nod to I mean like how long can you go without how long can you go without looking at your phone? You know what I mean? Like, we're just... Our attention is just, like, completely absorbed by technology, I feel like. And, like you said, like, a bunch of different things has to be going on. Like, if we're watching a little play, our our minds are going to be focused on other things, and we're going to want to do something else instead of focusing on that one thing, which I think is going to create harder education for, like, more generations to come. Um, But, yeah. I think that, like... People are just like addicted to like dopamine, and then they just like want more and more of it. And when they look at the five second video, they're like, "Oh my god!" But when uh they like have to like go and actually read out a book for like a couple hours or something, they're just like, "Uh, I don't really want to." Even though the book may have like some important insight and might be actually a very good book, they just want like immediate satisfaction and like. You can definitely really see that in the society, in like society now, and how like this book is actually like telling, and how like uh, society is like kind of going. Yeah, we're basically the book now, bro. We have short attention spans, <laughs> and we only want happiness nowadays. Man, this this author guy. Basically, this author. Fella. This guy's a little smart. All right, I think we covered everything we needed to. I think I think we're good for the podcast. Yeah. Yep, don't, good. don't forget to watch the Super Mario Smash Bros. movie. It is currently in theaters. Uh, use discount code BOBLO123 for a 5% <laughs> discount on the tickets. Other than that, thank you for listening to the podcast and have a great rest of your day. He probably turned it Bye-bye. off right now. <laughs>